Good morning, everyone. We're going to give everybody one more minute to come in and then we'll get started. All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, the topic today is the Bank Secrecy Act, and it will be presented by Matt Urban. Uh, before we get started, I would like to take a moment to go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, my name is Jackie Bannis, and I'll be the, the webinar organizer today. We want to make sure today's presentation is ex extremely valuable for you, so we ask that you submit all questions by clicking on the question button in the control panel and typing your question. Your questions are only visible to me, and I'll collect all submitted questions, and we will do the Q&A with Matt at the end of his presentation. So now for the main event, I would like to introduce Matt Urban. Matt works with credit union collection managers and other decision makers in Pittsburgh and throughout the state of Pennsylvania to evaluate and, and find effective solutions for their business and legal needs. He spends the majority of his time strategizing with credit unions to build and implement consumer collections programs, including the collection of outstanding receivables, delinquent accounts, and charge soft debt. So without further ado, I'll now hand it over to Matt Urban. Thanks, Jackie, and good morning, everyone. I'm glad that uh, everyone was able to uh, sign on and attend today. Uh, as we all know, the Bank Secrecy Act is uh, very exciting stuff, but we need to get our compliance in every year, and this is a great opportunity to do it. Um, what we offer here uh, at least twice a year. I usually do it in the summer. My uh, colleague and partner, Matt Young, uh, will do it uh, usually later later in the year. So we have a couple opportunities for credit unions to provide this uh, this valuable service. So today's presentation, as we can see from the screen, Bank Secrecy Act Basics, Recognizing and Reporting Fraud. Obviously, uh, some background information, make sure the phone is muted, any questions, uh, all those things that, uh, that Jackie had talked about. Today's agenda, we're going to go over a little bit about Weltman. Uh, most of you obviously know who we are, but we'll give you a little bit of that. Uh, talk about, of course, the goals of the Bank Secrecy Act, the minimum requirements for the financial industry, money laundering, uh, the customer identification program, uh, which will be one of the various acronyms we talk about, the CHIP, uh, recording, uh, record keeping, excuse me, and uh, types of reports. So a little about us, obviously we're a nationally recognized creditors rights law firm, uh, represent all sorts of creditors uh, from the smallest to the largest financial institutions uh, in bankruptcy, consumer and commercial collections, litigation, and real estate default matters. And clearly, uh, you know, obviously we take uh, compliance very seriously. Uh, and it's one of the most important things that we focus on as a firm. So with all of that out of the way, let's get into uh, what everyone's showing up for today, and that's the Bank Secrecy Act. So what is the Bank Secrecy Act? As I promised, plenty of acronyms. First one, Bank Secrecy Act, BSA, also known as the Currency and Foreign Transactions Reporting Act. So it's a good thing that they uh, narrowed it down to BSA. The Anti-Money Laundering Act uh, law is also what it goes by. It was passed by Congress in the 70s, uh, 1970 to be exact. It requires U.S. financial institutions to assist government agencies to detect and prevent money laundering. All credit unions and financial institutions must comply with BSA regulations. So what are some of the goals of the Bank Secrecy Act? Clearly, we want to safeguard financial industries, uh, the industry from threats posed by money laundering and illicit finance. Uh, clearly, this has uh, obviously been a, been a goal and a, you know, an issue for years. And I, uh, now more than ever, with, uh, with the prevalence of uh, the Internet and, and online, uh, it, is, uh, it is really the wild, wild west. And, and that's why we have to be very diligent to make sure that we're trying to catch all the, all the signs uh, and to ensure that there isn't any type of uh, fraud that, that is taking place, money laundering and such. 
want to make sure we have systems and procedures in place uh, and the programs are in place to pr protect the industry from threats. We're going to spend a lot of time, uh, there will be a common theme you'll see, make sure you have policies and procedures in place. Just like with any type of uh, any type of issue, uh, you got to make sure that you you have good training uh, to recognize and report fraud. And then, obviously, once you have good training, you have to have the systems and processes in place to make sure that that information gets where it needs to go, so we can stop the fraud in its tracks. Of course, BSA is also looking to ensure record keeping reporting systems are in place to help prevent, deter, investigate, and prosecute financial crimes. Where does all of this come from? Well, the Code of Federal Regulations. Uh, of course, we have all sorts of federal regulations nowadays, but uh, as far as BSA goes, uh, it requires that all credit unions establish BSA compliance programs. It must designate an individual responsible for coordinating and monitoring day-to-day -day compliance. It must establish and maintain consumer identification programs, CHIPS, or I guess called I, I, there's not an H in there, but we'll, we'll call it for that. But anyhow, um, moving forward, uh, must provide training for appropriate personnel, must provide for a system of internal controls to assure ongoing compliance, must provide independent testing for compliance to be conducted by credit union personnel or outside parties. Like I said, you got to have good policies and procedures in place. You have to have the right people in the right spots and make sure that uh, these issues are being taken seriously and addressed as they occur. So we're all in the financial industry, and this is a financial industry uh, issue. So what are the requirements uh, that we all have to uh, all have to follow? So the minimum industry requirements: establish a system of internal controls for ongoing compliance; designate individuals responsible for compliance management; a compliance officer. This compliance officer, of course, is going to coordinate and monitor day-to-day -day compliance among employees within the entire financial industry regularly communicate with the financial industry's governing bodies and authority to carry out compliance tasks. Delegate duties as, as appropriate and communicate established procedures to all parties. Also, we're going to need personnel training. You have to have specific policies and procedures in place, in, uh, excuse me, specific policies and procedures, adequate examples of suspicious activity and appropriate steps to take. We also need to conduct independent BSA compliance tests, review overall compliance, review individual monitoring systems for suspicious activity reports and currency transaction reports and other reporting instruments. Complexity may depend on product, services, customer size, and or geographic location. The important thing to remember about that is obviously if you're a small credit union, you're going to have different risks than a large credit union. So it needs to fit what you do and, and and how you, you know, the customers you service, the members that you service and things of that nature, where you're at, um, those types of things. So again, these are all very common sense and standard, uh, standard things that need to be done, not only in the BSA arena, but in other arenas as well. FCRA, uh, all, all sorts of other things like that, where, where it's good to have good solid policies and procedures in place to make sure that you are compliant and not running afoul of the uh, various laws and regulations that exist. So what are the main challenges that we face here? Of course, you have to capture the data. If you don't capture it, then you'll never know it's taking place. So if there aren't, there aren't uh, systems in place and there's not proper training in place to catch uh, what the bad guys are doing, then everything, you know, then then everything falls apart. Nothing, nothing, nothing happens uh, without without being able to capture uh, what the what the crooks are up to. Once you capture that information, what do you do with it? Of course, you need to com convey it to the compliance officer. Got to give the compliance officer something to do, right? So make sure you get that information to the compliance officer because they're trained to make sure that the information gets where it needs to go and is addressed in the appropriate form and fashion. Once you get the, once you get through all that, you need to ensure that the reports are filed. If you do everything that is listed there, then you're not gonna you're not gonna face the wrath of the government for not complying with the BSA, and more importantly, you are hopefully going to stop fraud in its tracks and prevent not only your credit union from facing potential uh, losses, uh, but also other credit unions. Uh, so we're obviously all in this together, 
and we don't operate in a vacuum. And if it's a situation where uh, the, the fraud continues to go and nobody pays attention to it, it will simply run, it'll run rampant and uh, it'll create massive losses for all involved. Because at the end of the day, um, the crooks are working hard. Uh, they're doing the, they're doing everything they can to uh, to, to work around the system and uh, to otherwise uh, get what they want without uh, without following the proper steps. So uh, these are important important uh, roles and positions, and it's important that we uh, that we that we take it seriously to make sure that uh, we're doing everything we can to stop it in its tracks. Money laundering. Everyone knows what money laundering is. Let's talk about it a little bit more and how it works. So what's the first step of money laundering? Usually placement. Uh, first and most valuable, vulnerable stage. Clearly, they are looking for a soft target. They're looking for a soft spot to be able to get the, uh, to get the funds into the system that they can go ahead and launder it. So in this case, the thief attempts to introduce unlawful proceeds into the financial system without attracting attention. That certainly goes without saying. They don't want to. They're, they're not. If, if they if they were doing it legitimately, then uh, then they then they wouldn't then they wouldn't be uh, then they wouldn't be criminals. So, what are some of the common placement techniques on slide 19? Structuring deposits in amounts to evade reporting requirements. Large deposits made in smaller, less conspicuous amounts. Refund checks. Depo- refund check deposits from canceled vacation or insurance policies. Purchasing a series of monetary instruments, such as cashier's checks or money orders, that are then collected and deposited into another branch or financial institution. So again, there are all sorts of various ways that uh, that our that our that our thieves can uh, can try to introduce this money into the system. So that's why it's important to make sure that there is a you know a good a good a good data collection system in place to make sure that we're checking uh, and, and not missing missing what's uh, missing what's going on because otherwise they'll sneak right in. So the second stage of the process in the money laundering is of course layering, uh, and it involves moving funds around the financial system, obviously often in a complex series of transactions, it creates confusion and complicates the paper trail. So they might call it layering. I call it the laundering part because uh, that's really what it is at the, at the end of the day. Uh, they're getting the money in there. They're spinning it around like it's in the washing machine and uh, moving it all about and, and mixing it up so that it's uh, impossible for somebody to find out what they're up to. What are some of the common layering techniques that we see? Exchanging monetary instruments for larger or smaller amounts. Wiring or transferring funds through numerous accounts in one or more financial institutions. So again, these are just little things that they're doing in terms of you know playing essentially playing games with uh, with with the system, uh, playing games with transactions to sort of throw people off for a loop. And if you know they see uh, some smaller transactions, it may not raise a red flag if somebody's trying to transfer uh, you know a thousand dollars versus a hundred thousand dollars. Sure, that's uh, that's gonna that's gonna draw less attention uh, in the day to day operations, and that's what they that's what they're counting on. They're counting on counting on us relaxing and not being able to uh, see what they're up to or you know think that uh, think that we don't care what they're up to because oh it's small it's uh, it's it's nothing it's not a big deal those are the, those are the tough ones to find and that's why it's important again to uh, to make sure we're on alert for for anything anything that possibly could come in so obviously the the ultimate goal of the money laundering is is integration so you know you want to you want to create the appearance of legality through additional transactions and that further shields the criminal from a recorded connection to the funds by providing a plausible explanation for the source. So, you know, uh, pr- pretty, pretty, pretty straightforward. They want, they want it to, they want it to look like they're legitimate in every way, shape, or form. And if somebody questions them, and they go back and say, "Hey, here's, you know, this, this is what we have," and it looks, uh, it looks straightforward to me. Uh, if, if they, if they've done all that, then, then they've succeeded, and that's what we're trying to prevent them from doing. So what are some integration examples? Purchase and resale of real estate, investment securities, foreign trusts, and other assets. So that gets us through the basics of the money laundering. So let's talk about the member identification program. Identity, identity verification procedures, easy for me to say. Uh, so what we're doing in this situation is, and we're including risk-based procedures for verifying members' identity to the extent reasonable and practicable. 
again, that's that's important. I mean, what you see a lot of times in the law is, and what us lawyers hang our hats on all the time, is, uh, you know, there, there's there's a reasonableness standard. What would the reasonable person do? Uh, clearly, uh, you have to have reasonable uh, procedures in place. Uh, you, you can't have a you, you can't do a full blown uh, investigation of every single member that comes in to uh, to confirm their identity. It certainly, isn't unreasonable to you know say this is an extreme example. You have to go hire a, a, a personal you know a professional investigator to to dig into their lives and make sure they are who they are. Um, but having reasonable policies in place, uh, that's what your standard is. So. Because at the end of the day, you have to form, like I said, a reasonable belief that the member's true identity is known. So if they say if they say they're John Doe and everything they provide uh, and all, everything they provide within reason suggests that they're John Doe, then they are John Doe. But again, you just can't you just can't assume that they are. Uh, there has there has to be there has to be some steps in place. So based on assessment of relevant risk factors, including varying types of accounts offered, methods available for opening an account types of identifying information available in the credit union size, location, and member base. So just, again, this is, this is all going to be uh, dependent on, you know, on, on what, what, type of, what type of credit union are you? Uh, are you big? Do you have a lot of online banking? How, do you, how are people able to open accounts? And of course, nowadays, it's, it's, it's so different. Almost, almost all of us, whether, whether you're big or small, have to almost uh, to stay to stay up uh, you know stay up with the modern times uh, offer uh, offer you know remote uh, you know remote membership uh, remote uh, you know loans and things like that when i say remote you know applying for it online and getting information people don't want to leave their house they don't want to come into a branch to talk to somebody and, and fill out that loan in, that loan application in person so it's important uh it's important to to make sure and especially with everyone having the phones and they're portable and they're you know it's it's just it's beca it's become more challenging so uh not that long ago it, it might have been it might have been a little bit you know a little bit simpler process for for some smaller uh credit unions but you know per not, perhaps not so much anymore so what is some of the information that is required? Obviously, you have to have procedures for opening an account uh, because otherwise, if you didn't, then there really probably wouldn't be a, a credit union to boot because anyone and everyone would be in there and, and, and God knows what would be going on. So obviously, you want to have procedures for opening an account. Must specify what identifying information shall be obtained from each member. So you need to figure out what you want to offer, you know, excuse me, what, what you need and, and then make sure the members provide it. At a minimum, on slide 27, at a minimum, you must, you know, must, have, must get the following information, name and date of birth for an individual, an address. Now, obviously, there's different types of addresses that people have. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, most people have a, uh, you know, have a business or a residential address uh, for where they live. Uh, clearly, you know if you if you service and cater to uh, members of the military, that's going to be a different issue. They may not have a permanent address. They may uh, they may they may they may be in a different location on a regular basis. So have to have that uh, have to have those uh, uh, that information uh, from those people and to make sure that uh, you can verify it. Uh, principal place of business, local office, or other f physical location, and that's what we're talking about a business. Clearly a uh, you know, a business doesn't have a quote-unquote home, although it does have a it does have the legal term of a principal place of business, which in fact is its home. But anyhow, you have to have you have to make sure that you're uh, getting that information. An identification number. So, what type of identification numbers are we looking for? Clearly, for uh, you know, for U.S. citizens, um, it's it's easy. The tax identification number, which is which is code for Social Security number. Um, if you have that, you know, or if you, you know, so if you have that, you know, that, that, those are easy, but what gets more challenging is, is for a non-U.S. person, one or more of the following is required, a taxpayer identification number, and so security number, passport number, and country of issuance, alien identification card number, number and country of issuance of any other government issued document ev evidencing nationality or residence, must bear a photograph or similar type of safeguard. 
So when we're talking about non-U.S. citizens, there are obviously uh, different people in the country for different reasons, and if they are in the country legitimately and legally, they should have some type of documentation that is necessary uh, to identify themselves and should hopefully uh, be able to provide that to you. In other, you know, and so you're able to, you know, conduct your uh, conduct your uh, you know investigation to make sure they are saying who they are is who they are. So what are some non-documentary methods for member verification? Credit unions relying on non-documentary methods of verification must document procedures in the CIP. Methods may include contacting a member, independently verifying the member's identity, compare information provided with the information obtained, consumer reporting agency, public databases, find information that will, that will confirm that this is who they are checking references with other financial institutions, obtaining a financial statement. If you're utilizing these non-documentary procedures, the following potential situations must be addressed. First one, an individual is unable to present a valid government-issued ID that bears a photograph or similar safeguard. Credit union is not familiar with the documents presented. The account is open without obtaining documents. An account is open without appearing in person. Other circumstances increase the risk that the true identity of the member cannot be verified. Again, remember, we're in the business of making sure that the member, if the member says that they're, they're one person, that that is in fact who they are. So that's, that's, that's the purpose for all this, and there's different ways of, of achieving that. So lack of verification. When a credit union cannot, cannot form a reasonable belief, there's that word again, reasonable, that it knows the member's true identity, procedures must exist to cover these scenarios. Terms under which a member may use an account while the credit union attempts to verify the member's identity. So again, you have to have you have to have these policies in place uh, if you can't form a reasonable belief uh, to, to determine who they are. When an account should be closed after attempts to verify a member's identity have failed. When a SAR should be reported or filed. So these are all things that again, as part of the policies and procedures. What happens if you know if you're unable to 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 verify who they are? Um, you know, should the account even be open? Should they you know when should it be closed? Those types of things. What types of transactions should they be able to use and do? Um, and do you need to file SAR? Uh, those are all those are all very very reasonable considerations that you have to have happen. And hopefully it's as simple as just being able to you know, confirm somebody has a, you know, as a, as a regular state issued ID, social security number, things like that. And they're able to, and you're able to move forward. But of course the, the world's a, a, a various, uh, you know, various comp, you know, various, has various complexities exist to it. It's a diverse place. A lot of people from a lot of different places. Um, and most of the people are, you know, just looking for, you know, financial services and financial products. Um, and they're they're certainly they're certainly not up not up to, not up to any dirty deeds or anything like that. But again, you have to make sure that you have policies and procedures to ensure that you are properly being able to service those people uh, who are look, who are obviously uh, you know, looking for services and uh, and are doing it the right way. So moving forward, uh, let's talk about let's talk about what type of record keeping that we need. So some of the procedures for making and maintaining, uh, you obviously you have to have procedures for making and maintaining records of all information obtained. Doesn't do you any good if you just have a you know big a big box uh, uh, that, uh, that you collect all the information in, or it just you know it's all mixed up. It, ha it has to be has to be some sort of procedures in place for making sure uh, that you that you're able to do something with those records and and, and have the and have those on file as needed. So supporting documentation shall be made available to any federal, state, or local law enforcement agency, any federal regulatory authority that examines the credit union for BSA compliance. Records must be retained for five years from the date the account is closed or the date the record was made. So it's bolded, so it must be important. So five years, hang on, hang on to that. You have to maintain these records for five years from the date of closure or the date the record was made. At a minimum, what does your record, what, what must your record have? Well, it has to have all identifying information obtained about the member. You went through the process of getting it. You certainly want to be able to uh, to document it down the line and, and be able to have that as needed. 
a description of any document relied upon, noting the type of document, any identification number contained in the document, place of issuance, date of issuance, and any expiration date, if any, description of verification methods and results, and resolution of any substantive discre discrepancy discovered. So obviously you've kept, you, you've gathered all this information. You need to make sure that you're properly storing it and that you have it available in case down the line somebody somebody is looking for that information, state, local, or you know, someone doing a BSA, uh, you know, your regulators, uh, the examiners doing a, doing a BSA, you know, compliance check. It's important that you have this, that you have these records and you have them in place. So comparison with government lists. Now, obviously, you have all these records. You need to be able to do something with them. So determine whether the member appears on any lists of known or suspected terrorist or terrorist organizations issued by any federal government agency. OFAC, specially designated nationals, SDN. Again, we have all sorts of little acronyms there. But again, you obviously need to cross-reference the information you have on the, with these lists to make sure that uh, you don't have uh, you don't have a known terrorist uh, trying to infiltrate the financial system through your credit union. Determination must be made within a reasonable period of time after the account is open. All federal directives issued in connection with such lists shall be followed. So what's that, what, what about adequate member notice? Uh, so what you want to look at is members must be provided adequate notice that information has been requested to verify their identity. Describe the identification requirements and provide notice in the manner reasonably designated to ensure that a member is able to view the notice or is otherwise given notice before opening an account. Post a, post a notice in the lobby, on a website, on account applications, or other form of written or oral notice depending on how the account was opened. So clearly, you need to be able to give your members notice that you're, you're requesting uh, certain information to verify their identity. Most times, I think most of us, if you look around, have, have information in, in, you know, in, in the lobby of a branch. Uh, it's certainly usually on all websites and, and related to, and other you know account products and things like that. So there's ways to obviously uh, you know provide that notice to your members. So we've sort of referenced this before, the suspicious activity reports, the SARS. And we'll get into what they are and, and, and what and what you need to do and when and, and how you need to do it. So suspicious activity reports, they must be filed if a credit union, and again these are bolded, so it's, you know it's important, knows, suspects, or has reason to suspect that any crime or suspicious transaction related to money laundering activity or a violation ha of the BSA has occurred. So again, remember those those key terms: knows, suspects, or has reason to suspect. Those are the those are the legal terms of art that exist. Clearly, if you know that somebody's up to something, you need you need you need you need to file SAR. If you suspect, now that's obviously not the same as knowing, but you 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 suspect there's there's good information that it appears that they you know that this individual is up to no good, then you need to file SAR. Or has reason to suspect. The reason to suspect is, is obviously more of a you know more of a you know, subjective uh, subjective uh, term because uh, you know if you're looking at information, it's staring you in the face and it's saying, hey, you know this this looks like it's a situation um, where there's some no good up to. Then then you ha then you have to then at that point you have a reason you have a reason to suspect if all the signs are pointing to it. Um, and even even some subtle signs, and again, that's where it's important that you have uh, you, you have people in place to 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 catch these things. Once you once you get, once you know of this information, management must promptly notify its board of directors or designated committee of any SAR that is filed. SARS aren't required for robber, robbery or burglary. These are the, you know these these are these are of course a little different. Uh, SARS sort you know the, the suspicious activity reports. People are trying to you know hide hide in the weeds. Uh, robbery and burglary is uh, they they were trying to hide what they were they were doing they were they were trying to steal from you uh, and were being very very blunt about it. Obviously, you want to report those uh, to the appropriate authorities. So, what are some of the common types of, of SARS? Money laundering, check fraud, mortgage loan fraud, credit card fraud, consumer loan fraud, check kiting, counterfeit check, identity theft, or false statement. 
SAR confidentiality and liability. A SAR and any information that will reveal the existence of a SAR is confidential and shall not be disclosed. Any request to disclose a SAR or any information that will reveal the existence of it should be declined. Immediately notify FinCEN and the NCUA if that request is coming in. SARs are not subject to subpoenas and a credit union or an agent of making a voluntary disclosure of any possible violation or law or regulation to a government agency shall be protected from liability. What does that what does that long sentence mean? Basically, if the feds or somebody is asking for the information and they're duly authorized to get that information, you can provide it without fear of getting sued. SARS reportable activity. Insider abuse involving any amount. Transactions aggregating $5,000 plus where a suspect can be identified. $25,000 plus regardless of a potential suspect. And $5,000 plus that involve potential money laundering or BSA violations. Transactions that fall into any of the following involve funds derived from illegal activities or intended or conducted in order to hide or disguise funds or assets derived from illegal activities, basically illegal stuff, uh, are part of a plan to violate or evade any federal law or regulation or to avoid any such transaction reporting requirement under such designated to evade any BSA requirements and have no business or apparent lawful purpose. So what are the filing procedures? Well, what to file? A suspicious transaction shall be reported by, guess what, a SAR. Uh, it's going to collect and maintain supporting documentation. Uh, clearly, you have to provide, you know, if you're going to file it, there, there obviously is a reason to file it, and you have that information, you need to include it. When to file? No later than 30 calendar days after it is initially detected. If no suspect was identified on the date detected, filing may be delayed an additional 30 calendar days. Reporting shall not be delayed more than 60 calendar days. So again, minimum, minimum, you got to get it in by 30. If you aren't able to identify uh, the suspect, uh, then you have at least, you have basically another 30 days for a total of 60. The SAR shall be filed with FinCEN. How to file it? Well, after July of 2012, there's mandatory electronic filing. The SAR currency transaction reports are required as of 2013. Standard standardized SAR for everyone. Save template, save the template, and fill in the member information. Obviously, helps to have have consistent information, similar to you know when you're using eOscar on on fair credit reporting and act information. SAR filing shared branching in cases affecting multiple branches, which credit union is responsible for filing? Technically, both must report. However, FinCEN does not want to receive multiple reports. Decide which party will report in your shared branching agreement. Confidentiality. The subject of the SAR cannot know of its filing. Allows for a joint SAR filing. So moving forward, we've covered the SARs. Uh, let's talk about currency transaction reports. So beginning on slide 48. Currency transaction report. Another acronym, CTR. Uh, report transactions greater than $10,000 or foreign equivalent, deposits, withdrawals, exchange of currency, other payment by transfer, by or through or into a credit union. Um, that's, you know, everyone generally when they, when they always sort of hear about the you know, $10,000, that's, that's, that's something that you know, most of the general public seems to know and understand from watching movies and shows and everything like that. But uh, this is real life and it exists. But the more currency transaction report information. Of course, for transaction where the CTR is required, verify and record the individual's information. Name, address, account number, social security number or taxpayer identification. Deposits, anyone benefiting from the transaction, including joint account holders. Withdraws, only the person conducting the transaction. Unless other information known leads you to believe others will benefit from the transaction. So here, well, here's some examples. A wife withdraws $12,000 and doesn't say what it's for. You report the wife. Husband deposits $12,000. You're going to report both. Wife withdraws $12,000 and says it's for a car for her and her husband. You're going to report both. When do you have to file the CTR? You must file within 15 days following the day in which the reportable transaction occurred. How to file? File it with FinCEN. Copies of reports shall be kept for 
five years from the date of the report. Cash in, cash, trans out, uh, cash in and cash out transactions may be reported on the same CTR if they are both if they both qualify as reportable trans as reportable transactions. Transactions should not be offset against each other. So here, let's go let's go let's go over a few examples. First one: member deposits eleven thousand dollars into savings account and withdraws three thousand dollars from checking. What should you file? Well, the answer is a CTR for the savings deposit, savings account deposit should be filed, but not for the withdrawal. Example two, a member deposits $6,000 into its savings, withdraws $4,000 from their checking, and presents $6,500 in U.S. currency exchange for foreign currency. What should you file? One CTR with more than one entry. The cash-in transaction is reportable for the total amount of $12,500. So the $6,000 deposit and the $6,500 uh, for the currency exchange. The cash-out transaction is reportable for the total amount of $10,500, $4,000 for the withdrawal, and $6,500 returned in foreign currency. Next step in the process, we have the aggregation. Multiple branches and multiple transactions. So structured transactions. What is the definition of structured or structuring? No person shall, for the purposes of evading the CTR requirements with respect to such transactions, one, cause or attempt to cause a credit union to fail to file a CTR, cause or attempt to cause a credit union to file a CTR that contains a material admission or misstatement of fact, structure or assist in structuring or attempt to structure or assist in structuring any transaction. Transaction of exempt persons. A CTR is not required for any transaction between an exempt person and a credit union. Exempt persons include another financial institution, department or agency of the U.S. or of any state, uh, or any pub, uh, political subdivision of any state, so you know, federal, state, local authorities, an entity that is established under the laws of the U.S. of any state or political subdivision of any state or any under interstate compact between two or more states that exercise government authority on behalf of the U.S. or in any such state or political subdivision. That's a mouthful, basically a governmental entity uh, that is operating under with the authority of government businesses within the U.S. or a state, any other non-listed business that maintains a transaction account for at least two months, frequently engages in transactions in excess of $10,000, is incorporated or organized under the laws of the U.S. or any state, or is registered as an el and eligible to do business. You need to designate an exempt person by filing a FinCEN Form 110. It's not required for currency transfers to and from any of the 12 Federal Reserve Banks or exempt persons list. Designation must occur within 30 calendar days of the reported transaction, and you must do an, an annual review. What are some ineligible businesses? A business engaged primarily in one or more of the following activities may not be treated as a non-listed business. First, purchase or sale to members of any motor vehicles of any kind, vessels, aircraft, farm equipment, or mobile homes, the practice of law, accountancy, or medicine, auctioning of goods, charting or operations of ships, buses, or aircraft, gaming of any kind, gambling outfit, investment advisory services or investment banking services, real estate brokerage, pawn brokers, title insurance and real estate closing agents, trade union activities, and any other activities that may be specified by FinCEN. So let's talk about currency purchases of monetary instruments. Record keeping only required if the daily purchases aggregate $3,000 or more. So if a purchaser has a deposit account with a financial institu institution, you need the name of the purchaser, the purchase date, the type of the instruments purchased, serial numbers of, of said instruments, and the dollar amount of each of those instruments purchased. You have to verify the identification of the purchaser. How can you do that? Member signature card, non-members. Examine the document 
examination of a document normally acceptable within the banking community is as means of identification, in which contains the purchaser's name and address. If we're dealing with wire transfers, the originating bank is going to transfer, dealing with transfers in excess of $3,000. You have names and address of the originator, the amount, the execution date, payment instructions, and the identity of the beneficiary bank. What type of information sharing are we talking about? Well, federal, state, and local or foreign law enforcement agencies investigating terrorist activity or money laundering may request FinCEN solicit certain information from a financial institution. So again, similar to similar to a SAR, you're not if, you, if the feds or some other government or you know police forces uh, has a valid and legitimate reason to request the information, you can provide that information to them. After receipt of a completed certification from a law enforcement agency, FinCEN may require a record search to determine whether the financial institution maintains accounts or engages in transactions with any specified individual entity or organization. Upon request, the financial institution must conduct a one-time search of its records, including current accounts, accounts maintained during the preceding 12 months, and transactions conducted outside of an account by or on behalf of a named suspect the preceding six months, during the preceding six months. Positive matches must be reported to FinCEN within 14 days via the SISS system. No details should be provided other than the fact that there is a match. Negative responses are not required. So if there, nothing pops, then you have no response, you have no obligation to notify FinCEN that there was no there was no hit on that particular search. Financial institutions may only use the information for reporting to determine whether to establish or maintain an account, or engage in a transaction, or to assist in the uh, BSAML compliance. Subjects lists are not permanent watch lists. Subjects subject lists generally relate to one-time inquiries and are not updated or corrected if an investigation is dropped, a prosecution is declined, or a suspect is exonerated. Inclusion on a subject list would not be the sole factor to use the sole factor used to determine whether or not to file a SAR. Actions taken pursuant to the information provided in a request from FinCEN do not affect the financial institution's obligation to comply with rules and regulations of OFAC respond to any legal process, or to file a SAR and to immediately notify law enforcement if necessary. A financial institution may not disclose their primary banking regulator, the law enforcement agency requesting the information, and the fact that a request has been made. Documentation that a search was performed is essential. Uh, SISS search self-verification document, copies of forms returned to FinCEN, and documentation. What type of voluntary sharing should we look at? Well, some of that some of that voluntary sharing would be information sharing. Of course, is encouraged. That's why it's voluntary. Uh, but obviously, you want to make sure that you have uh, you have the information out there and, and to help prevent uh, another credit union from from being subject to uh, the potential fraud. Uh, it's good to have uh, voluntary sharing in place because again, you want to identify and report activities involving terrorist activity or money laundering. Of course, that's the goal. Specific protection from civil liability is provided. So if you're sharing information that is uh, hopefully you know, leading to uh, detection of uh, terrorist or money laundering activities, uh, you can't be held you can't be held liable civilly uh, for disclosing that information. Of course, that wouldn't make any sense if you were held liable for that type of for that type of disclosure. But financial institutions must notify FinCEN of its intent to engage in information sharing. You just can't do it. You got to notify FinCEN of what you're up to. Must establish and maintain adequate procedures to protect the security and confidentiality of the information. Processes and policies should be developed and implemented for sharing and receiving information. Notice to share information is effective for one year, so it doesn't it doesn't go on in perpetuity. It's good for one year, and you must take reasonable steps to verify the the other financial institution with is which who you intend to share it with also has submitted the required notice to FinCEN. So clearly both credit unions need to be uh, submitting submitting their uh, submitting the appropriate notice to FinCEN. You want to make sure that you have the 
processes and procedures in place. And of course, if you already have it in place, uh, if you already, you already have it in place for you know for the mandatory information you're required to share, then this certainly is, is isn't anything unusual. But there should be a separate policy. You should have a separate policy in place to specifically deal with the situation of voluntary sharing. May be redundant and very consistent and very consistent with your with your other policies. So therefore, which gives you gives you a good excuse to you know you're out you're out of excuses not to do it because basically it's I don't want to say it's a cut and a paste, but it's very similar to what you've already done. So you might as well have the policy in place to do it. Information received from other financial institutions is subject to the same use restrictions and confidential uh, confidentiality requirements of required information sharing. Financial institution is not authorized to share a SAR or disclose the existence of or not its non-existence. And information obtained under Section 314B may be used to determine whether to file a SAR. Again, very consistent with the required information sharing uh, that you that you're already that you already have policies and procedures in place to do. So let's talk about this OFAC. OFAC we've uh, we've referenced at different points. Uh, the OFAC is the Office of Foreign Assets Control. Policies, procedures. Uh, what are some of the policies, procedures, and processes? You need to designate an OFAC officer. You need to have independent testing, screening requirements for new accounts, current members, and non-members. Member account access. Determining whether OFAC hits are valid or false positives. Report positive matches to OFAC within 10 business days. Sounds very familiar to other policies and procedures you need to have in place for, for the other things we've talked about. Procedures for reporting block funds to OFAC. Depending on the nature of the sanction, transactions to or from entities identified as a positive hit must either be blocked and account funds frozen or the transaction rejected. And of course, you have to have training. So what are some of the commonly cited violations? that financial institutions such as credit unions run into. BSA, AL, AML, uh, risk assessments not detailed. MDD procedures not specifically documented. Inadequate MDD on MSBs, again, all these acronyms we've already talked about, inadequate MDD on shared branching third parties, and SARS not completely uh, or completed correctly, the narrative. So again, if you aren't completing the forms and conducting the assessments in a proper form or fashion, as we discussed in, earlier in the presentation, those are going to be the common those are going to be the common uh, violations that you'll get you, know, you get from your examiner. That's why, as we said over and over, it's been important. It's important that you have good policies and procedures in place. You have the right people in place. If somebody, of course, leaves, you need to make sure that you have uh, somebody able to step in and fill that void. Uh, obviously, if people go on vacation or they're sick or they're away. There needs to be there needs to be people that that, that step in and handle those situations. Of course, if you're in a small credit union, uh, that's probably that probably I probably just described you and the, the other people you work with because uh, everyone does everything. Everyone wears every hat. But again, it's important to make sure that there are redundancies in place to make sure uh, that things aren't getting missed. What are some other commonly cited violations? CTRs fail to list all beneficiaries. No specific OFAC risk assessment. Weaker undocumented OFAC policies and procedures. No procedures for reviewing law enforcement requests and training deficiencies. Some of the penalties that exist. BSA violations involve civil, civil criminal, and intangible, pen, intangible penalties. So basically everything. Uh, federal banking agencies and FinCEN can bring civil money penalty actions ranging from $500 to $500,000, quite the range. Criminal penalties include one to ten years of imprisonment. Director staff may be permanently banned from the credit union industry. Everyday noncompliance is a separate violation. So the penalties are severe. The penalties are steep, and there are substantial consequences for not complying with the requirements of the law. Therefore, it's important to make sure that uh, to, to make sure that you're following along and doing what you need to do. So, what are some fraud prevention tips? These are all probably going to be pretty pretty common sense, but let's go through them. Use due diligence to help detect fraudulent uh, fraudulent transactions. Does the transaction make sense? Believe it or not, common sense still does exist in the world. I think. 
uh, it is a large amount. Is it a large amount of money? Invert the problem. Consider the situations from a thieves' perspective. Ask questions. Some of the resources for staying up to date, other than attending you know, BSA training, uh, the U.S. Department of Treasury uh, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network (FinCEN) uh, issues a weekly digest bulletin email. Uh, NAFQ uh, has a daily compliance blog. And of course, subscribe to uh, good old Weltman for articles and alerts delivered right to your inbox. We're obviously here to help and provide the information because this is an area that continues to change on a regular basis. And that wraps up uh, the presentation today. There's my, there's my, there's my lovely picture um, and my information, contact information. If anyone ever has any questions or concerns or needs to talk about anything, I'm more than happy to help and answer any questions at any point or time. So at this point, I, I appreciate everyone who's attended today, and we will turn it back over to Jackie to see if there are any questions before we hop off here for, for lunch. All right. Thank you, Matt. Um, if anyone does have a question, you can submit it now, and I'll read it off to Matt in a minute. Um, but other than that, thank you, everyone, for your time today. I hope this presentation was very informative for you. Uh, there will be a recording of the presentation along with a brief survey sent to you later on today, and then certificates of completion for the BSA training requirement will be sent out to you uh, within one week. And then be sure to visit our website, waltman.com, to view upcoming webinars. And then let me see... Nobody has submitted uh, any questions, so thank you everyone for attending, and uh, have a good day.